Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with Indian activist Kumar Sundaram as he continues a successful three-month trip to Japan. He talks about the Japanese anti-nuclear movement, information that's not getting into international media, even on social media, and continues to warn about the nuclear pact between Japan and India, just ahead of a visit to Japan by India's Prime Minister Modi. Kumar provides a truly global view of how the nuclear industry intersects its greed for expansion with national policies and how it continues to manipulate the perception of this deal in the media in both Japan and India. Plus our regular features, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those aging rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information than Donald Trump is able to grab in the feline section of any local animal shelter. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, October 11, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. First, a correction. On last week's Nuclear Hot Seat number 276, we named the United Kingdom as our numbnuts of the week for having signed contracts to buy new nuclear reactors from France after official reports came out on multiple defects with the design. But as Dr. Ian Fairley took the time to point out, it wasn't the country or the people. It was the government that was to blame. They are the ones who signed the deal. And so the U.K. government is the actual numbnuts of the week. We apologize for the error. Here in the U.S., we dodged a bullet last week when Hurricane Matthew, a Category 5 storm, bore down on the east coast of the United States, including the St. Lucie Nuclear Power Station in Florida. So you understand the potential danger that was faced St. Lucie was built on a barrier island, which is a sandbar off the mainland and surrounded by water. As the storm prepared to make landfall, a Department of Homeland Security nuclear expert posted this message. I'm here with the nuclear plant safety team, meaning at the St. Lucie nuclear power plant, in the direct track. We are making this highly NSA classified report in case we cannot contain the inflow valves at this nuclear station today. No national or local news about us here trying to secure this nuclear plant is allowed. We will have our NSA phones and devices cut off from public contact shortly. This is as serious as Fukushima. Hours till direct impact, waves over 30 feet in Gulf Stream, landfall right here. Reactors require off-site power to keep the radioactive waste, a.k.a. spent fuel, from overheating and igniting. In case of a loss of power, such as happened at Fukushima, backup batteries are only good for several days if they manage to keep from being flooded, which is what happened at Fukushima and led to the meltdowns there. Storm surge reached 5 feet, and hurricane-force winds of 130 miles an hour pounded the facility. In anticipation of the danger, on October 4th, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission issued an unusual event for St. Lucie and declared an emergency. (coughs) Fortunately, no emergency took place, though there were some pretty shaky hours there. Sharing this thought from attorney Susan Hito, who is an Indian Point activist, she wrote, We need a national call for the nuclear plants in the path of Hurricane Matthew, I would say in the path of any hurricane, to be orderly shut down before the storm hits. Among the points she cites, orderly shut down instead of a scram emergency shut down in the middle of the storm is much safer. Would that such a policy would be instituted by the NRC? 
additional impact by Matthew is part of this week's nuclear reactor duck (laughs) and cover report. At Robinson in South Carolina on October 8th, at the height of Matthew, an unusual event was declared due to loss of off-site power from the qualified off-site source. This resulted in an automatic reactor trip. (coughs) At Harris in North Carolina on October 8th, at the height of Matthew, an unusual event was declared due to loss of all off-site power capability. This happened while the reactor was already in hot shutdown mode and necessitated the use of emergency diesel generators. (coughs) Also at Harris in North Carolina on the same day, October 8th, an unplanned actuation of the reactor protection system occurred. An unexpected steam valve transient occurred, and this resulted in an unplanned reactor trip and safety injection. Don't know what all that means, but it doesn't sound good. Not necessarily Matthew-related, on October 9th at Surrey in Virginia, an automatic reactor trip took power from 100% to zero. (coughs) And at Seabrook in New Hampshire on October 7th, a prohibited substance was identified inside the protected area. It was described as a small remainder or butt of a marijuana joint. The substance was obviously very old, so it is surmised to be from a pre-operational period. Considering that Seabrook went online in 1990, that's an awfully long time for it to be overlooked. The substance is currently under the control of the site security department and will be turned over to local law enforcement for disposal. Duck! At the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, two additional ceiling collapses have been reported. On Nuclear Hot Seat number 275, we spoke with Don Hancock of the Southwest Research and Information Center about the September 27 ceiling collapse. The underground WIP site is meant to store plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste in tunnels and rooms dug in an old salt mine. The intention is that, over time, the salt would settle and collapse, sealing in the nuclear waste and burying it forever. But since two accidents underground in February of 2014, including an explosion of a waste barrel from Los Alamos National Laboratory that contaminated the underground, Maintenance of the ceiling has not been taking place because workers can't get down there and stay down there long enough to do the work. These two additional collapses were reported on October 4th and October 7th. Deja vu all over again and deja vu all over again. Meanwhile, a new report says the Los Alamos National Laboratory will stop disposing of low-level radioactive waste at its largest waste disposal area, known as Area G, by October of 2017. The lab was shipping its low-level waste from Area G to the WIP site in Carlsbad, which stopped after the explosion in February of 2014. So the waste has to be moved out, but there's no guarantee that the WIP site is going to be available to receive it. So what we're seeing now is a major case of nuclear homelessness. And as with most homeless issues, Nobody wants it in their neighborhood. Over to Japan, where an alert has been raised after Japan's Mount Aso erupted, blasting smoke and ash seven miles into the air. Mount Aso is the largest active volcano in that country, and it began spewing plumes of smoke and ash in the early hours of Saturday, October 8th. Only 50 miles to the south of Mount Aso is the Sendai Nuclear Power Plant one of only four reactors in that country that have been restarted since the post-Fukushima shutdowns. We'll keep you posted. At the site of the Fukushima triple meltdown, a leak of highly radioactive water from a wastewater tank has been discovered. Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, the operators of the facility, say that the water likely leaked from a seam in the tank. Now, in terms of the danger of radiation levels in water... The World Health Organization estimates that increased cancer risks are created by doses above 10 becquerels per liter. 
The Environmental Protection Agency here in the United States sets that level at 7.41 becquerels per liter. TEPCO's analysis found 590,000 becquerels per liter of beta-emitting radioactive materials in the water. They estimate that 32 liters of such highly contaminated water had trickled out, mixed with the rainwater, and remained within a barrier around the tank. A major report has come out showing increases in perinatal mortality in prefectures contaminated by the Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown in Japan. This came to our attention from Fairwinds Energy Education. To try to put this in accessible language, if in 2010 there was one birth and one death every 28 seconds in Japan, beginning in 2014, three years after the Fukushima nuclear disaster began, there was one death every 25 seconds and a birth every 31 seconds meaning the deaths were coming faster and the births taking a little longer. This may seem like a slight differential, yet it is significantly faster than what happened in Ukraine after Chernobyl. We'll have a link up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 277. In further international news, a United Nations court has thrown out cases brought by the Marshall Islands against the U.K. and others for allegedly failing to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. The Marshall Islands had sought to use this case to force nuclear powers to disarm. The tiny nation has been in the forefront of anti-nuclear activism after ecologically devastating American bomb tests at their Bikini Atoll. The U.S., India, and Pakistan were accused by them of failing their obligations under the 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. But the International Court of Justice said it could not rule on the case. If you want to know the details about what this case is about, I suggest that you take a look at the excellent film, Nuclear Savage. In Russia last week, the government launched a massive three-day nuclear war training exercise that involved 40 million people. The nationwide civil defense training exercise was meant to ensure the country is properly prepared in case of a nuclear, chemical, or biological attack from the West. With relationships between Russia and the West continuing to deteriorate, and Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin suspending an agreement with the U.S. over the disposal of surplus weapons-grade plutonium, the country has also announced plans to build underground facilities beneath Moscow to shield 100% of the capital's population from a nuclear attack. In Taiwan, that country's Food and Drug Administration affirmed that there is no timetable for any lifting of a ban on food imports from five Japanese prefectures that were affected by radioactive fallout from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant meltdown in 2011. Taiwan has banned all food imports from Fukushima, Ibaraki, Tochigi, Gunma, and Chiba prefectures. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. In a stunning non-story, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the United Nations Nuclear Watchdog Group, Director Yukaya Amano, declared on Monday, October 10, 2016, that a nuclear power plant became the target of a disruptive cyber attack two to three years ago. He also cited a case in which an individual tried to smuggle a small amount of highly enriched uranium that could have been used to build a so-called dirty bomb. The incident happened about four years ago. This is not an imaginary risk, Amano told Reuters, without providing any details. We never know if we know everything or if it's the tip of the iceberg, he said, declining to give details of either incident. He did say that the cyber attack had caused, quote, some disruption, end quote, at the plant, although it did not prove to be very serious since the plant did not have to shut down its operations. He continued, this actually happened and it caused some problems. 
Now, security experts say blowing up a nuclear reactor is beyond the skills of militant groups. But the nuclear industry has some vulnerabilities that could be exploited. And I could win the lottery tomorrow, but in order to do so, I'd have to buy a ticket. Now, Reuters, this quote-unquote story does not exactly fulfill the journalistic imperative for the five W's and the H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Still, the award has got to go to director Yukaya Amano of the International Atomic Energy Agency as being this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, it's coffee time. That's right. I'm asking you to buy me a cup of coffee that I will never drink. And instead, send the equivalent of that cup of coffee, plus a nice tip for the barista, to Nuclear Hot Seat as a donation. If you get your verifiable nuclear news here, enjoy the interviews, find you're learning something, and maybe even laugh a bit, much more than one would expect when dealing with nuclear issues, become part of the ever-growing support network for this show. We make it easy for you to donate. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and follow the prompts. PayPal, debit or credit cards, all of it's accepted. If you prefer to donate by check, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com to get that all-important snail mail address. You can make this a one-time caffeine or decaf-based donation, or let's get together once a month. We'll make it a date with a recurring donation, which is also easy to set up on PayPal. Trust me, this will be the best cup of coffee that neither of us ever has a chance to drink. As always, I'm grateful for whatever you can do to help support the work of Nuclear Hot Seat as we keep going and growing and getting into as much trouble as we possibly can. Indian anti-nuclear activist Kumar Sundaram has been featured often on Nuclear Hot Seat. He is a true firebrand in India's ongoing fight against nuclear technology. Kumar works as a research consultant with the Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace, known as CNDP. Right now, he's in Japan for three months, where he's been speaking to groups as he gathers support against the planned India-Japan nuclear agreement. He joined us via Skype, which was acting a bit more Skypish than usual, when we spoke on Sunday, October 9, 2016. Kumar Sundaram, it is so good to again have you as my guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. Hi, Libba. It has always been a pleasure to talk to your audience, and Nuclear Hot Seat is a wonderful platform, so I'm really glad to be back again. You are in Japan now, and you have been there for several months. What brought you to Japan, and what have you been doing in your time there so far? Libe, I am talking to you from Hokkaido, the northernmost island of Japan. Uh, this time I am here for a short-term fellowship, but I am also using this opportunity to meet a lot of think tank and civil society activists, scientists, and also grassroots people. I have been to Japan several times after Fukushima, and uh, between India and Japan, we have a good civil society level collaboration. But this time, I'm getting an opportunity to uh, interact with people at the grassroots, meaning uh, people living near the power plants who have been strongly opposed to nuclear restart, which the Abe government has been strongly pushing for. So I'm talking to you from Hokkaido. This weekend, we had a two-day seminar here where people from across Japan, those uh, people, the, the local communities protesting against restarts, they had assembled here. And for the first time, they came up with a national network of anti-nuclear restart movements. And they came up with a strategy. So I was part of their, I, I listened to their presentations. I also spoke briefly to them. And uh, I also attended their strategy session. So I think this is a very, very good opportunity for me to be here in Hokkaido today. 
This is excellent news because, of course, when activists link up, when the groups come together and share strategies, if they're working on similar issues, it's that much stronger. What can you tell us about the state of the movement against restarts in Japan that is happening at this time? Briefly, and before I get it on to the India-Japan nuclear agreement, which is my primary campaign here, I would definitely like to share with you the whole experience with the movement here. Fukushima, as you know, one of the big fallouts of Fukushima has been a very strong civil movement in Japan. And generally, the civil society in Japan has not been very active and vocal. Japanese people generally don't speak out when it comes to political issues. But what has been unprecedented that their trust in the government system, the corporations, have been really shaken after Fukushima. So Japanese people, we can say that they are angry for the first time. So after World War II... This is a situation in which there is a clear rupture between the government and the people. There have been protests. And I have been coming to Japan in past five years and participating in a lot of protests and meetings. Uh, let me tell you that in these five years, the Japanese people have come and hit streets repeatedly. So in the middle of 2012, when the movement was at its peak, there would be something like 200,000 people. And they had hit Tokyo streets. So they were massive, massive very intense protests in front of the parliament, in front of the prime minister's office. And that was the peak. The massive protests in post-Fukushima Japan forced the government to declare that by 2030 they will shut down all nuclear power plants. So that is officially the position. It also forced the Japanese system to come up with a better regulator with more stringent safety laws. And also it allowed the new regulator to have provision for local communities participating in the regulatory process. But as we know, the Japanese nuclear industry and the international nuclear lobbies, they have been pushing really hard to restart a lot of these power plants. So as of today, only four power plants are working. All of them, all the rest of them are in shutdown. But the industry is really pushing hard for restarting all of these power plants. And they are using so many indirect and direct pressures. There is a pressure like the loss from running these power plants in shutdown is being passed on to the customers. There are also other kinds of pressure on the politicians, on the government. As you know, there is also a really bizarre pressure that the new entrants in the market, meaning the renewable energy companies, they have to share the loss of Fukushima. They have to share the revenue loss which these utilities are going through. So this, in a way, is a way to disincentivize renewable energy. So this is just to say that there's immense pressure under which the local governments and the central governments, they are trying hard to restart these power plants. And for last one and a half years, there have been really, really massive protests at the grassroots against these restarts. So uh, the protest at the grassroots is released really intense. I attended, as I said earlier, the two-day meeting, which for the first time, the anti-restart movements across the Japan had. And some of the issues that they discussed here was their strategy on how to go ahead. And the strategies include legal strategy because the regulator now allows local people to participate in the system. They are also taking these power utilities to local courts. So in some cases, as you know, these uh, judgments have been really in favor of the people. And people here also contemplated political strategies in terms of leveraging their support base with the political parties. The ruling LDP clearly has a pro-nuclear position. Shinzo Abe has been really, and, and uh, it's, it's a ridiculous pro-nuclear position that LDP has been taking even after Fukushima. So one of the strategies is to leverage the lagging and lobbying with local politicians as well as local assemblies and the elections. So that was discussed here. People also discussed the public campaign against restart. So the whole focus of the movement here now seems to be shifting to local protests against restarts. And that's why they thought of coming together with a national network. Because in the cities like Tokyo, now you don't expect those big numbers. So that was the instant reaction to Fukushima accident in which several hundred thousand people 
turned out. But now the battle has shifted to uh, these grassroots protests, local protests, and they need to be nationally coordinated. There has to be a media strategy for that. There has to to be a legal political strategy. So those strategies were discussed. And I could feel the intense energy coming out of these activists because some of them, even before Fukushima, for decades they have been protesting against these uh, power plants in their uh, vicinity. For instance, I'm talking to you from Hokkaido, which is a big city with some uh, 20 million people. And just 70 kilometers from here, there's Tomari nuclear power plant. Now, the government is trying hard to restart it as soon as possible, and it's one of their priorities. And Tomari nuclear power plant is facing strong local protests. People told me that they are focusing on the evacuation uh, plan because all the nuclear power plant uh, utilities are supposed to prepare an uh, evacuation plan and put in place in advance in case of an accident. And these plans are really, really ridiculous because uh, most of the time in Hokkaido, there is snowfall. So if an accident happens in winters, there are no roads for people to evacuate. So that's the situation here. That's the same situation that is faced here in the United States or really anywhere with a nuclear reactor, that even if the operators of the reactor say that there is an evacuation plan, like they say, for example, at Pilgrim, which is at the foot of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, there's absolutely no way for people to get out. It is impossible. So it's interesting that it's the same problem that is faced not only throughout Japan, but here in the States and probably around the world, that if one of those things malfunctions, there's truly no way to get away from it. Exactly. So one of these... Stipulation says this evacuation plan, and people here are focusing, and they uh, will take the utility to the court based on the fact that the evacuation plan is totally uh, non-existent. In case the accident happens in winters, they'll simply not be able to flee. And between the reactor and the mountain, there's huge population. So they will not literally have any place to flee in case of an accident. Also, what is important here is there's this population called Ainu, which is a distinct community. They have their own dialect, they have their own culture, slightly different from the mainland Japanese. And they have been for decades feeling this discrimination. So as we have seen in case of uh, nuclear mines and nuclear power plants across the world, the disadvantaged communities are further marginalized by the nuclear industry. So that's happening in Japan as well. So yesterday, near the Tomari power plant, the protest started with an Ainu prayer in which they reaffirm their closeness to nature. So the Ainu community here is at the forefront of the struggle against uh, restarting Tomari power plant. And as you said, this whole question of evacuation I've seen it in India as well. Just exactly on March 11th this year, in a power plant called Kakrapar, which is on the eastern coast of India, there was an accident. And it was really shocking that the population centers are near that power plant fall in another district, administrative district. And the district magistrate of that district did not have any clue about evacuation because the power plant is in a separate, different district. So these kind of administrative problems and regulatory problems we have in all our countries, as you said. So uh, the protest here against restart is focusing on evacuation plans. It's focusing on the legal strategies, the political strategies. So I am here and I could feel a lot of energy. Let me ask you something. To what extent does the Japan Secrecy Act factor in on this? Has it continued to be an impediment or are people just moving through and not letting it stop them? The uh, Secrecy Act is definitely a problem, brought at least partially to you know, shut people from asking questions. And uh, yesterday, the whole day-long uh, strategy meeting did discuss about how to overcome this challenge. So they are trying to use information from which they get in from one utility to sue the other utility. So they are trying their own in innovative ways. And they are also deploying some very, very good lawyers. So it was really good to see that some really good lawyers have uh, volunteered to fight these cases on pro bono basis. And that's happening from Fukushima to Tomari to everywhere. So there are legal hurdles. hurdles. The Secrecy Act is a big problem. And we have a Secrecy Act in India as well for nuclear. But the grassroots communities are trying to overcome and, and work around these hurdles. 
what, if anything, have you learned about Fukushima in your time there that perhaps is information that has not gotten out from Japan, either because of the Secrecy Act or because lines of communication have broken down? In Fukushima, now the struggle has shifted. There are a lot of legal struggles going on. I spoke to Ruiko Muto, who on behalf of the people in of Fukushima, she has been suing the utilities for compensation. And the most recent uh, legal interventions and struggles are happening against the efforts of TEPCO and the Shinzo Abe government to minimize the number of people who are getting these compensations. These compensations, as you already know, are really meager, very basic. But even then, TEPCO is trying to deploy every trick to minimize the numbers. So, for instance, they have declared now that some of the areas, uh, um, the, they have lifted the evacuation orders, and now they have asked people to go back. If these people go back, they know that uh, the radiation levels are still high. They also know that the basic infrastructure is not simply not there. So there are no schools, no markets, no post offices, none of these basic infrastructure exists there. But simply because the government and TEPCO have come together and lifted the evacuation order, so they are now telling people that you either go or you have to let go of the meager compensation amount that you're getting. So that's a big challenge. As you know, there are more than 90,000 people who are still living in these temporary housings. They are still dependent on these uh, the compensation that they are getting, the monthly compensation. And they have to fight even for that. So this is a really, really bizarre situation in which the government is deploying these really unimaginable tricks to deprive people from the basic compensation that they have been getting. And uh, the legal battle has shifted to that. The people are also trying to, because TEPCO has said that the entire money which is required to decommission this reactor, they will not be able to come up with that kind of money. So there, there are efforts to ensure that the losses are not passed on to the customers. The losses are not passed on to the renewable energy sources because that's one way to restart all these nuclear power plants. So these are the kind of fronts on which people of Fukushima are now forced to fight. I find myself using the word devastating so often when I do an interview and find out what's going on on the ground and hear what people are dealing with in order to get any kind of compensation or even fairness or even sanity when they have to deal with those in charge of the nuclear issue. I'd like to shift this over to what just happened with the Manju Fast Breeder Reactor, where the Japanese government seems to have decided against continuing with it. Now, this is a reactor which they say is intended to burn plutonium from spent reactor fuel from conventional reactors to create more fuel than it consumes which doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me, but then I'm not a scientist trying to convince people to do this. Has the decision to stop funding it actually come about? And if not officially yet, how close is the country to it? Last month, the government announced that it will set up a committee and start a process to consider what it would take to uh, shut down Monju and to decommission it. They are obviously not clearly accepting that they are going to shut it down, but at least they have started a process. In this process, also, there are opportunities for people and local communities to intervene. That they are doing. As you know, they have this so-called nuclear village system in Japan, in which the nuclear industry has made local people dependent on them. So it's really unfortunate, but what I gather from the struggle around Monju is that the local municipal council and a lot of people who have been dependent on Monju and the establishment for their employment, for their livelihoods, they are now worried that if the power plant is shut down, where will they go? So the community stands divided. And that is true about other power plants as well. Monju, as you know, is a fast breeder power plant. And across the world, these uh, so-called fast breeder reactors have been huge failures. France had to shut down its Phoenix. Monju has hardly worked. In its entire last 20 years, it hasn't really worked. It has gone accidents and shutdowns repeatedly, even before Fukushima is what shut down. I have visited Monju, and Monju now they have said they are considering seriously to shut it down. So that is the status. 
The problem is also about the huge amount of spent fuel that Japan already has. A lot of countries which embarked on the path of nuclear in 50s and 60s, that includes India, had this massive vision about setting up a large number of so-called fast breeder nuclear power plants. These are called fast breeder because they actually are supposed to breed uh, nuclear fuel. So they consume plutonium and they breed more plutonium than they consume. That's why they are called breeder reactors. But they have been a huge failure across the world because cooling them is a big, big, big challenge. So in Monju, they use sodium. In the Indian fast beater also, which is uh, being planned, they are planning to use sodium as coolant, and that makes it very, very dangerous because as soon as sodium comes in contact with environment, air or water, there's a blast. So safety of fast beater reactors has been a huge problem. Monju, they have declared they are considering shutting it down, but that leads to the huge problem of ascent fuel and the plutonium. So what is Japan going to do with hundreds of tons of plutonium which the country has now? The plutonium is highly radioactive and toxic, but it's also a proliferation challenge. So now as the reactors are shutting down, these are huge issues that we have to deal with. We have to deal with spent fuel, we have to deal with the cost and safety of decommissioning, etc. Coming to Monju, there's this agreement between U.S. and Japan about dealing with spent fuel and plutonium. So that agreement is coming for review in 2017. And now the Japanese civil society is trying to get some foothold to force the American and Japanese governments to revise this agreement of transporting a huge amount of spent fuel from Japan to U.S. This transport is dangerous and risky. They will be transporting highly radioactive spent fuel to the U.S. for reprocessing. And in Japan, not only Monju, which is a fast breeder reactor, but also Rokkasho, which is in Hokkaido Island, where I'm currently. So these two kind of facilities, the fast breeder reactors and the reprocessing units, which use spent fuel and which practically use plutonium, which is also used in weapons. And hence, they have safety as well as proliferation problems. Now the Japanese system has to deal with what will they do with the reprocessing plants and the fast breeder reactors once they decide to shut down all these power plants. So that's a huge challenge which is coming up now. There's a long-standing relationship between India and Japan when it comes to nuclear issues. And I know that Prime Minister Modi has visited Japan with an eye to solidifying nuclear ties between the two countries. Where does the relationship between the two countries, where do the agreements stand at this time? The Indian Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, will visit Japan next month. So the media says by the middle of next month, the Indian prime minister will visit Tokyo. And one of the key things that he's supposed to seal is this finalizing the deal between India and Japan for nuclear supplies. When the Japanese prime minister Shinzo Abe visited New Delhi last year in December, with a lot of fanfare, the two governments declared that in principle, the deal has been reached and now the details are being worked out. This happened last year. So everybody is expecting that this November, when the two prime ministers meet, they will announce the finalization of the deal, which will also include a lot of contentious issues. And apparently the governments have been claiming that they have been together on the table for more than a decade now, and they have solved these contentious issues. But these issues, these issues are very, very crucial, both for the Japanese side and the Indian side. For the Indian side, it practically means that once the India-Japan deal goes through, at least eight to 10 new nuclear power plants uh, will be expedited. And these plans are really massive. So, for instance, India is setting up six so-called EPR, European pressurized reactors, which are being imported from France in a place called Jaitapur, which is on the western coast of India in Maharashtra state. And uh, similarly, it's setting up six reactors from GE, General Electric, in a state called Andhra Pradesh. So these reactors, which are essentially being imported from America and France, 
the negotiation for these reactors has already happened at least eight years back but still they have been in pipelines there has been no groundwork practically and precisely because these two plants require very very crucial japanese components and in lack of an india japan agreements these projects of us and france have not moved on the ground so as soon as india japan agreement goes through these six eprs and six reactors of ge will be expedited on the ground which will mean immediate dislocation for tens of thousands of people which will mean that the government is setting aside the basic environmental requirements for these power plants which means that a lot more people lose their livelihoods immediately which also means that the whole safety issues come up and as you know in india there is no independent safety regulator the indian system can be relied upon to be totally unaccountable in case of a potential accident so it will lead to all these issues from the japanese side if the japanese corporations who are trying to restart reactors here they are able to offset some of their losses by exporting power plants and technologies outside then they will be able to survive and fight for the next day so that's important for even the japanese civil society to stop not only restarts but also exports so that's also one of the uh, battles here it's my understanding that india instituted laws after the union carbide bhopal disaster regarding the necessity of corporations that provide materials and expertise in the creation of these power plants or industrial situations that they have financial and legal responsibility if there is an accident if there is a disaster and that that was one of the sticking places in the agreement between Japan and India for these reactors has that been handled yes yes libe that has been a contentious issue in agreement with japan and not only japan but also with the us france canada and other countries india has experienced the worst industrial disaster so far in form of the uh, bhopal accident in 1984 december people in bhopal continue to struggle for basic compensation and rehabilitation and that was the uh, atmosphere which forced the indian political system in 2010 when indian parliament was discussing a nuclear liability act that was also the time when the supreme court of india came up with a small word, verdict on a small case related to bhopal and we widely felt that the justice has been too little and too late so that was the atmosphere in which the indian nuclear liability act was being discussed which meant that a very small very watered down provision but still a provision has been incorporated in the indian nuclear liability act which provides for a potential uh, right of recourse for the nuclear operators to sue the nuclear suppliers in case of an accident so in the indian act it's not directly the people but the nuclear operator which has a right against nuclear suppliers but the nuclear suppliers like ge westinghouse ariva now it's edf rosatom and japanese toshiba and hitachi they have been really reluctant to sign these agreements with india because they want to be totally out of the hook so they want a total liability free playing field for themselves and that is what they have been insisting at now both the american corporations and japanese uh, are not so much france because in a weird way it has, it has its own mechanism to pass on all these uh, burdens to the public but definitely american and japanese companies they have been trying to outmaneuver the indian system and have a liability free mechanism so they insisted with the modi government that it should ensure that it's really shocking that the modi government worked against the interests of its own people and last year it has constituted a so called nuclear insurance pool which consists of 15000 crores in indian currencies uh, money which will come from public sector insurance companies which is essentially public money which means people's money so in a way the government itself is circumventing the law so in case of an accident happens a uh, nuclear accident these suppliers the nuclear vendors will be liable under the 
Indian Nuclear Liability Act. But now there is a system that they can channel this liability to this insurance pool, which means channeling it back to the Indian people. So this is a really shameful mechanism which the government of India has come up with, which is acting totally against the Indian national law, which is acting against the interest of Indian people. But this is what they have come up with to placate the international nuclear lobbies. And the Japanese corporations now seem to be satisfied on that count. So apparently they have found a way. But we must see that this is a really, really perverse way to deal with liability. This is not something which Japan should have done, considering that it is still going through the accident and the losses, and its people are still trying to struggle with meager compensations. So it's really shocking and disappointing that Japan also is being part of this process of circumventing the Liability Act. So that is the status. How well is this information known in India or Japan? Is word getting out or has it been stifled in the media? The party which is in government now, it was in opposition in 2010 when the nuclear liability law was being discussed. And interestingly, it did act responsibly because it was in opposition. So it wanted then a more stringent law. It wanted this uh, Clause 17B of uh, right of recourse against supplier not to be diluted. But once this party is in power, the same party is now circumventing the law. It has almost entirely the media on its side. So there is not much public discussion. Some uh, pro-people lawyers have taken the government to the court, but the Indian legal system is such that these cases will drag on and on for decades. So the situation in India is not really encouraging. What other concerns are there regarding this deal between India and Japan? Yeah, so apart from these concerns of liability, safety, technology, and cost of the civilian side, there is also a huge concern about uh, proliferation. When the two governments reached the Memorandum of Understanding last year, it was interesting that when Shinzo Abe came back to Japan and he made a statement in the Japanese parliament that was totally different from the statement which the Indian side made to its own parliament and to the media. So now the story goes like this. Mr. Shinzo Abe claims that the Indian government side has promised him that it will not consider, it will not conduct further nuclear tests. And that's a demand which the Japanese government has put up for more than a decade. That it, for, for having an agreement in India, it, India needs to make sure that it will not conduct further nuclear tests. Now in India, we have the ultra-nationalist BJP in power, and they'll never agree to this demand. So to the Indian side, the Indian government is feeding this story that no such promise has been made regarding nuclear tests, and India has its independence, autonomy, so-called really pervert autonomy to conduct future nuclear tests. So when it comes to the test option, the two governments are telling totally different stories to their own people. So when Mr. Modi comes here, it will be really interesting to see what is the final text, what is the final outcome. And we are demanding that people should be allowed, that the whole negotiation should be transparent. So civil society activists, both in India and Japan, have approached the government to share details of these negotiations. But they have been away closely kept secret. So we are concerned about the future of nuclear tests in India. And uh, that's a really, really concrete and real concern that we have. Because as you know, in both India and Pakistan, they are handling nuclear issues in a very dangerous and childish manner. So we have regular borders skirmish and politicians and media from both sides. They talk about using nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons are talked in South Asia in a very frivolous manner. So the whole weapons and proliferation concern is a real issue. So it is uh, to be seen how Indian and Japanese governments deal with the nuclear test question in the agreement. You said that you will still be in Japan for about another month, at least on this trip. Yeah. What are you hoping to accomplish in the time that you have left before going back to India? Yes, Libra, I'm here for another month. 
and i'll be talking to civil society activists i am also planning to meet a lot of parliamentarians so last week when i was in tokyo i went and made a presentation to eight members of parliament in the japanese parliament they have this cross party forum called the nuclear zero caucus in japanese they call it uh, zero genpatsu no kai and this has mps both from the ruling party and several opposition parties and left wing parties so i made a presentation in front of them and they have 70 members inside the japanese parliament both from the upper house and the lower house and i'll be meeting a lot of these mps individually and uh, in the last election at least three or four strongly anti nuclear and environmentalist mps have been elected so i'm relying on them then that they'll take this issue up and in the parliament and outside they're already talking that the deal should be made transparent and the issues like uh, the test option the liability should be made public and these are issues which will force the government to rethink the entire deal so i'm relying on the mps even in the ruling party there are some mps who have a better sense of the situation post fukushima so i am trying to lobby with them i am also talking to the media so by the end of this month i will be talking at press conferences in tokyo and osaka so i am also going to universities and talking so i am delivering talks in tokyo kyoto and other campuses Uh, so i'm trying to do as much as i can to raise awareness about this agreement and to request people various sections of the japanese society to reconsider this agreement which will be disastrous for people of india kumar you do such remarkable work at such a fever pitch and in more than one country is there anything we can do to support you the listeners of nuclear hot seat in the work that you yeah. are doing in the middle of uh, november when the indian prime minister visit tokyo a couple of weeks before that we'll launch an international petition and i'll send you the link so i would request your listeners and you to help us in getting as many signatures as possible from worldwide to force the indian japanese government to stop this agreement because it's an international disaster if a nuclear weapon test takes place it's an international and irreversible consequences it will have similarly the nuclear industry when it is on a terminal decline it is trying to find markets in these newer countries like india which have lower safety thresholds so in order to roll back the nuclear industry in post fukushima world it's very very important to stop these newer markets so it's not just an agreement between india and japan it has international implications and i would through you request uh, your audience to consider supporting us and i'll send you the link of the petition which we'll launch so that's a help which i will definitely request you we'll be happy to provide that for you kumar thank you so much for now thank you again for being my guest this week on nuclear hot seat thank you libbe the nuclear hot seat and you have been always wonderful so i wish you luck and i thank you once again Indian anti-nuclear activist Kumar Sundaram. You can read more about the work that Kumar and others have been engaged in at the website dianuke.org. And we'll have a link up on our website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 277. Activist shout out looking not at individuals but two important and related issues this week both having to do with downwinders a downwinder is a person living downwind of a nuclear test site weapons plant or reactor where the risk from fallout or radiation leaks is greatest in salt lake city utah on monday october 3rd the downwinders of utah archive launched This is an interactive collection of maps, videos, and documents related to nuclear fallout from Nevada weapons testing between 1945 and 1992. The Downwinders of Utah archive is administered by the University of Utah's J. Willard Marriott Library, and the collection is available online at downwindersofutah.org. In one particularly chilling audio clip. A radio warning alerts residents of St. George to stay indoors as a change in wind is pushing the cloud from a nuclear test in their direction. 
The radio warning emphasizes resident safety, adding that area schools have been instructed to not allow outdoor recess as a precaution. Then the voice says, there is no danger. This is simply a routine safety procedure. And if you believed that, there was a lot of prime swampland in Florida for sale that would catch your attention too. Meanwhile, repeating this item that if you lived within 10 miles of the Rocky Flats nuclear plant between 1952 and 1992, you are wanted to be included in the Metropolitan State University of Denver Health Survey. No health survey has ever before been conducted on Rocky Flats residents. This health survey, completed by residents from those years, can establish the need for medical monitoring. The Veterans Administration has recognized certain diseases as resulting from exposure to ionizing radiation, meaning the kind that comes from nuclear facilities. These include cancers of the bile ducts, bone, brain, breast, colon, esophagus, gallbladder, liver, lungs, pancreas, pharynx, ovary, saliva gland, small intestine, stomach, thyroid, urinary tract, including kidney, renal, pelvis, urinary bladder, and urethra. Then there's leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, non-malignant thyroid nodule disease, parathyroid adenoma, posterior subcapsular cataracts, tumors of the brain and central nervous system, heart problems, autoimmune disorders, skin disorders, neurological disorders, MS, autism, and anxiety or mental health and illness problems, etc. So if you lived downwind of Rocky Flats and you're facing health problems, let them know. You can get more information at rockyflatsdownwinders.com forward slash health dash survey. And of course, we'll make it easy for you to find this information because there will be a link up on the website. Here's today's final thought, and it comes from one of my favorite sources, miningawareness.wordpress.com. Nuclear power is nuclear war every day. Nuclear reactors, mining, waste, and processing continually, legally leak lethal radionuclides. The reactors are ticking time bombs. Stop them now before it's too late. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 11, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from miningawareness.wordpress.com, nytimes.com, aminewswire.com, akinstandard.com, albuquerquejournal.com, kotatv.com, capecodtimes.com, democratandchronicle.com, independent.co.uk, toledoblade.com, nhk.or.jp, deunrenard.wordpress.com, fairwinds.org, no nukes action at googlegroups.com, bbc.com, can.com, energytransition.de, reuters.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the smart, good-looking, above-average, heart-centered souls in the anti-nuclear movement all over the world. The people who gather at the Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook site, which you are all invited to come on down to join us, like us, and share our posts, but only with those people who you care about the most. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that there's a reason why Nuclear Hot Seat is downloaded in 112 countries. That's because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, please. Because we are all in the Nuclear Hot Seat. 
nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.